Hi, and welcome to Best and Fest. I'm Leslie Lepage. I'm the director of the Lafemme International Film Festival, and this is a podcast for everyone who wants to learn about making all sorts of content for entertainment worldwide. And today, I'm super happy to have on the show Luca Saveri, who um, is amazing. Uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, not only that, he's joining us from the beautiful country of Italy, one of my favorites. He has many, many experiences um, with Raya Sky and Media Set in Italy, but also he started off working with Nino De Laurentiis as a second unit director on some of his projects. He then moved into forming his own company in Italy, which we're going to extensively talk about. Uh, he has uh, directed over 10 films, features, TV shows. He's co-produced eight international films. He's produced over 40 backstage documentaries, uh, specializing you know, in some really interesting content. Uh, he actually collaborated with the White Lotus 2 production documentary, Unpacking the Episode, produced by his uh, backstage film, was nominated for the 2023 Emmy Awards. He, some of the wonderful films that he has directed was Calypso in uh, 2017, and he is currently the executive uh, producer on the, or was the executive producer on the Book of Clarence, but he's got so much that going on, I can't wait to ask you, okay, so you are this young kid in Italy who wants to be in film and you jump over to Los Angeles and how on earth did you get hooked up with, with Dino? <laughs> Because that was really kind of like your that was like your career aha moment, right? I mean, he 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 nurtured you and and, and brought you up the ranks. One hundred percent. Well, thank you first of all, Leslie, for hosting me in this amazing occasion. And you're totally right. That was certainly one of those incredible moments that I think happens in in the career of everyone. But you need to be ready for it because it can be totally random. And in my case, it was completely random. I think uh, there was probably a sort of misunderstanding. At that time, I was working as a camera operator. I was working as an editor because I could operate a camera, but also edit. And um, Dino was producing uh, this documentary. Uh, they had a second unit director who, for some reason, you know, stopped working with them. And so uh, they wanted an Italian uh, second unit director. I was super young. And I think... For a number of common contacts, a person that knew me, uh, but knew me as a like very emerging director, mentioned that mentioned to his assistant, I think, hey, I can introduce you to this, uh, you know, Italian guy. I think he probably expected like a much more experienced uh, Italian. Right, some old Italian dude that he was good at, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're talking about Dino you know, the so Academy Award winner producer. Even at that time, yes. <laughs> At that time, you know, he was 89 at that time. So, you know, a pretty seasoned producer. Um, and, uh, I had a phone call from his assistant uh, asking me to meet him in his home in Beverly Hills. And that was obviously, you know, shocked almost. And I did. For some reason, I don't know if they had no other choice, if they had no time to look around or something. But I was the one who had to jump on board. And we made it work. Uh, I think I think I did a good job. Also, I think uh, he kind of liked me personally, and so that was a starting point, you know, to my career in film, really, because I was foreigner, I was really young, I didn't have so much experience in film in movie sets uh, back then, so I I was struggling a little bit to make the right connections and to fit in the Hollywood environment, and that changed every, everything really. Right. In like a, in like a second, it just changed it all in, in like a second. Be yeah. Because from there you, you ended up working with him on, you know, other collaborations, right? It wasn't just, a, a, um, you know, this, this first thing, how, how was it working with him? Um, you know, as a director, I know that he was very particular, um, but also very nurturing at the same time in a, fatherly Italian way. 
hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, I was twenty four; he was ninety, so he could have been easily my grandfather. And I think you know, uh, it figured I was literally doing my best to make it work in the film industry. And so, it's been really everything. It's been a mentor. It has been like a, a, a business model. Also, uh, it's been a lot of things. It's also been the connection. Weird to say, but it's been my connection with the Italian film industry. Because when I came to the U.S., I was barely starting. So I started my career in America. And then he was the hook because I became so much more visible uh, for the Italian film industry as well. Uh, thanks to him, thanks to the Italian side of the De Laurentiis family, uh, which were their nep his nephews, basically, who brought me back to work uh, in Italy. So if I have to pick a word, I would say it's definitely one of my uh, biggest mentors. And a funny little, you know, story to say is that um, one day, you know, I was I came to his home and I was very, very uh, tired and, and sad because I kind of submitted, you know, the script, you know, one of my scripts to some other producers. And they refused to read it. And, you know, I was so pissed off, you know, and I came to his home and said, I mean, he might have noticed that. I think also his wife, Marta de Laurentiis. Unfortunately, both of them are not with us anymore. But she was also the kind of person. And they probably noticed that was really, you know, sad. And so he asked me, yeah, he asked me, you know, what's going on. I told him, listen, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so tired of this system. You know, they never, you know, give you a little bit of tiny space even to present your project as a emerging director, this and that. And I was making a big thing out of it. And he told me one thing that ended up being the slogan of my company, which is something super Neapolitan. He, he told me in Neapolitan dialect, of course, which became the perfect synthesis, the, the perfect summarize of show business and film industry. He looked at me like, like if I was saying the most obvious thing, and he told me, Luca, don't care about it. Show business is a show. That was boom, like on, you know, don't, it's, you know, we're not saving lives. We might change lives, but you are on a free ride. You're on a roller coaster. You're part of it. You got to accept the good sides, the downsides, and it's a whole a big show. You're part of it. Accept it. How's it? You can fight it. Accept it as it is. And so that was a interesting spark in my career. And I tributed it. On, on my company's slogan. Right, from this Napoletano, you know, comment of it's just a show. Yeah. The Apollote was lo spettacolo, and lo spettacolo. Show business. <laughs> exactly. What, but what was really, really, really interesting is, is after you, you got the knowledge or the show, right, the business, the show business aspect, you then got brought back into... um Italy and and then you started doing a series of these you know uh promotional what you guys call promotional docs we're we're calling like behind the scenes uh docs uh, but you so you started working and and creating this in the Italian forum but then you also took the knowledge base of how Hollywood operates um into Italy so how, how did that all happen for you so I was brought back by the Italian side of the De Laurentiis family uh, to Italy. He told me, hey, we're doing a very big uh, old period piece film in Cinecittà. Cinecittà is the biggest studio in Italy, famous for Fellini and all the big names of the Italian cinema. And uh, I was never been in Cinecittà. And so I was like, sure, immediately, <laughs> let's do it. Um, and But they understood I was very young and they gave me one of the best opportunities that uh, emerging talent can have. They told me, hey, you got to learn. And the best way to learn is you come to a place where you are a little a little bit protected, where you have to prove yourself, uh, where you're not going to make too much, dam too much damage, but at the same time, you're going to be exposed to an extremely intense learning process. And so filming behind the scenes for me, it's been exactly that. So this was a incredibly incredible smart uh you know uh thinking of of the the Laurentiis producers uh because yeah the family they surrounded me 
of the best team I could ever possibly meet um, doing my job uh, in a limited environment, but with incredible names. My first film was this uh, period piece, uh, all shot in Italy in Chinichita. Uh, the second film I did with them uh, had Robert De Niro starring. Uh, and so obviously, you know, I was such an incredible uh, big name of, of uh, international filmmaking coming to Italy and, and I was living in LA. So I had also the opportunity to establish a little bit of some sort of relationship uh, with an American movie star. And then a, a ton of other projects where literally I learned every single step of film production. Uh, and this was before I could direct my first feature film. And I think it's been best school for me, really, the, the best uh, mentorship program I could ever expect. Also because I was making money out of it. <laughs> so I was, I was making a living out of it while I was learning. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting because, you know, the old time Hollywood families, you know, that, that would bring in some of the new up and coming, you know, they've kind of dissipated. We don't really have that, you know, I guess, secondary farm, so to speak, you know, training um, ability uh, anymore. So you were kind of on that last tail end of one of the great, you know, family, filmmaking families, you know, out there um, to, to have that opportunity. But then you started moving into really directing, um, you know, long form features um, and and really forming different uh, out branches to your own company, which is LSPG. So um, how did that, how did that develop when you started? Because you were writing all, all along, but how did that really go into that first one that you just jumped into? So we're talking about 2008, 2009, 2010. And in LA, there was a brand new wave of talents creating a different kind of cinema that didn't exist in Europe. It barely existed. In, in the US and I figured it was very similar to what happened in the 60s with the new Hollywood wave. Now this was different because digital filmmaking was just started starting. Um, yeah, streaming platforms were just starting and talents such as, you know, Sean Baker, uh, Chloe Zhao uh, and others, you know, uh, were starting to make a different kind of movies with different techniques. And I was shocked when I saw this happening right in front of me. Uh, very small team, very aggressive crews shooting in the streets, um, indie films that we had no access to. And studying their production model, I figured that this was very far and very different to what I was seeing in a studio environment in America and also in Italy, which is almost all studio based, even though you know, it's in a, in a much smaller range. Uh, here, it's really uh, much more related to big entities, to big companies or to networks. So there was this gap of films or stories that was not covered. And so I figured, okay, I think there is an opportunity here. Things are changing. And so we can probably uh, be part of it. Um, one of the biggest questions was, how do we finance that? Because the, the, the this b biggest struggle of being independent is that you don't have access to big forms of financing. And so we thought about a way, me and my team, of creating a company that could sustain itself almost entirely. And we built up four different departments uh, that still exist today. Back then, we only had the Los Angeles office even because even though we were mostly Italians, we were all living in L.A. and working in L.A. Um, first department, of course, was the production department, which back then wasn't producing anything yet. The second one was uh, production service department. So we were doing somebody else's projects. Initially, it was mostly television projects, uh, documentaries or little fiction projects. Then it became movies. Uh, the third division was what we were doing for the most part. So behind the scenes, EPK content, and then uh, post-production laboratory because we 
were all editors as well. We knew how to create deliverable packages, and we figured that we need to we needed to do it for our own little films. And so, why not expanding to uh, the rest of the independent filmmaker filmmakers community? Uh, in this way, we had three entities that were making some money, making a living out of uh, for us, and creating a revenue that we could invest in first place in our films. Um, this worked in LA, but we figured that we could have many more opportunities to double up in Italy, being Italians. Here in Europe, especially, there are very interesting uh, form of incentives if you are investing in movies, so you can maximize your investment. Right, but at that time, there were no incentives. So at that time, you were st- they were just starting. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, and so we were trying to create this hybrid model approach bringing maybe italian creativity and way to uh you know make things in a smaller scale to hollywood and at the same time taking the best of of what we were learning in hollywood and bringing it to italy creating international potentially international films uh new kind of stories and also making work italian and american crews all together um, in a way that normally only studios could do. Uh, this started with the first smaller, small projects, of course. Uh, then we we grew, we grew, we grew, uh, and uh, until we're now, you know, fully, fully operational, both in America and in Italy, and we're now scouting to open our third branch uh, in Asia. What what's really ingenious about this is is when you were doing and keeping kind of the food model going, which is your the the the, the feeder to everything else, which is your behind the scenes content docs. Um, that also gave you the ability to meet the executive producers, the producers, the talent, um, which of course could be mm, tapped back into on projects and co-productions because you ended up then really moving into some really um, interesting co-productions um, and executive producing some content that um, was quite exciting, right? Um, and tapping into the indie, the indie market, which is kind of the undercurrent uh, still in Italy. I want to touch on two things. You, you you said the the studios are really running at uh, the Italian cinema, but not so much anymore, right? Because we have now a really undercurrent of Italian indies out there. Can we just talk a little bit about that, and then I want to uh, I want to go back to some of your business models. So, of course, things have changed uh, from two thousand nine, two thousand ten, also in Italy, also in Europe, and so. Uh, Especially because the the market, the audience, you know, the market started to look for different stuff, for new stuff. So films that seemed impossible to make or to have some sort of uh, outreach uh, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, now they're super popular and they're, uh, the audience is actually craving for them. Uh, and so also, uh, I think, you know, uh, part of it, uh, you know, it, it's what we tried to do since the beginning and we're still doing it. But there are some some other um, talents and companies who follow the same path and thinking, okay, maybe we can think a little bit outside of the box. Um, of course, we have to say that uh, that was probably an interesting intuition, but it was possible also because of the technology changed massively. So now, which much smaller and compact cameras and which much lighter equipment, you can reach incredible results and compete in festivals, compete in the market with much bigger movies. And so that, of course, it played a big role in it, as well as the new uh, distribution uh, formats. Um, of course, uh, there are now also um, moments, uh, gathering moments like Film Festival, who are specific for indie films, also in Italy. And they're certainly much more community-based other than market-based. Uh, and they, they are basically very, very uh, followed events because they have a very specific vibe or theme or crowd, uh, which I don't think, you know, uh, fights against the, the mainstream system. 
but it's a difference. It's a difference. This, this the example I always give is, you know, uh, the the ethnic uh, ethnic cuisine. You know, uh, back in the day, you know, you could only eat a few few things, especially in Italy. You know, only Chinese or sushi cuisine for the most time. Now you can have Ethiopian restaurants. Same thing. Same thing. The taste opened up. You know, uh, expanded. Um, and this is a great opportunity for, for every single market because the market is now global, 100% global. Uh, and so the hype we see now for Korean films or for some African films, uh, from Iranian films, and for Italian films abroad, we had a great success in the Philippines with one of my movies, which you know we really never expected. This is incredible and very exciting. Very exciting. Right. And I think since COVID, that's really tripled in in the hunger of people wanting to see cross content. You know, the domestic market here in the US isn't just about domestically created English speaking content anymore. You know, we're now bringing in content globally and seeing what that is. But even with the shift in, um, in in that, you know, festivals have also shifted. And one of your models um, is really helping indie indie filmmakers who are securing distribution uh, uh, get their get their act together and 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 create all the deliverables needed for distribution, which a lot of indies don't understand how to do, when to do it. And when they get to the point of distribution going, yes, you know, we want your film, they have to scramble to put this together. So so you you created another feeder into your your global company that also helps a little bit of the indies as well. Um, you want to mention what that is and, and how that works? Of course. Well, you know, first of all, uh, how did that happen? One of our films had pretty great, great success. We ended up having an opportunity, which was screening in a very important theater, Chinese theater in Los Angeles, in Hollywood Boulevard. Perfect. And we got in touch with the organizers of this event, and they were like, yeah, just bring us your DCP. And we were like, hey, what the hell is a DCP? We didn't know, because it's a, such a technical aspect so far away from actual film production that we were shocked. So we looked around and we figured that, you know, uh, it's, it's a whole series of uh, materials you have to create once the film is done to actually go into distribution and have the audience be able to see it. It's a bunch of papers, contracts, payments, uh, conversions of your files, testing and everything. Um, so we made an investment in my company to be able to create that internally because, of course, the uh, perspective, the long-term project was to make many movies. So we thought, okay, maybe we, we better learn how to do this for the future as well. And once we had that up, uh, a great intuition of my marketing guy back then, Gianmarco Bellavista, his brother still works with us in, the, in, our, in our sound department. He now moved to New York. Uh, was like, okay, you know, maybe this could be an opportunity and be helpful also for the entire indie community. Independent filmmaking is very much based on uh, community. It's a really community-based environment uh, when it's done pro, sharing experiences, collaborating, and everything. So we thought that this was a great occasion to serve the audience um, of our fellow produ indie producers and filmmakers uh, to teach them and support them in creating these materials. We had the machines able to do that. We had the experience. We had the knowledge. And we found so many other uh, filmmakers who were in our same position, position that we, where we were years before. Uh, you have an incredible film. You have an opportunity right there, but you don't have the right pieces. And so, And that's really important because it's something that takes a lot of time, may take a lot of money, so you got to plan ahead for that in the exact same way that you plan how to, which kind of lens to use or what kind of camera. Um, 
DC Parole is the department of, of my company, of LSPG, that takes care of that uh, and uh, is now serving several, several film festivals and hundreds of filmmakers, especially in the United States, um, some also in Europe. Uh, and we recently expanded uh, again following the new trend of distribution to create entire distribution packages with all the content and testing, everything you need uh, to properly distribute your film. At the end of the day, we're audience as well, so we want to watch more films. And in order to watch more films, we need to make them available. And what's really interesting about uh, DCP for All is that they, um, or you guys, I should say, uh, make it very easy for the non-technical indie filmmaker that may have already gotten through all posts, but now you know, has an opportunity to start screening in film festivals and doesn't have a DCP or, or gets distribution and they don't have the entire package. They can come to you guys and you will create the entire entity for them uh, at a really indie rate as opposed to a studio rate that they can't afford or puts them into hawk. Um, and you're partnered up with our film festival. So I, I you know, want to endorse uh, DCP for all um, for the indies filmmakers out there listening to the podcast. Um, that it's a phenomenal um, deal that you guys are offering. But more importantly, you're, you're creating a solution for these uh, film festivals for the filmmakers, etc. Um, I want to segue back to, you know, you started off as a cinematographer. That's your 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 eye is is trained looking through the camera. How do you see that relates in a positive or possibly negative fashion when you're now directing and you have to have maybe somebody else run the camera? Um, <laughs> how is that working for you? How do you bridge those two parts of your mind on set? It hasn't been uh, too much of a stressful change because, yes, I've always worked, uh, especially at the beginning, as a cinematographer and camera operator. I have to say I always had a great relationship with cameras and lenses, not so great a relationship with light. Working with light is a very, very specific thing, as it is working with actors or as it is writing, for example. Uh, I'm a director who doesn't write for a choice because I always write my subjects, but then I figured that to translate in words exactly what I have in mind, I need to have someone with that talent do it for me. So I always establish a good relationship with a proper screenwriter, which is the right one for uh, every every project. And we work together on that and he helped me uh, you know, deliver in paper what I have in mind. With a camera, I see the frames. I always see the frames way before even looking or reading the script. When I think about a story, I see the, the images. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you need to create a certain style and a certain look. That was something I was struggling more with the camera. And so being able to collaborate with cinematographers who have that experience and that taste and that talent to understand what I want to have in the frame, in the right way, but pull off the, the effort of dealing with a, with a tool like light that I don't know much, that I, I'm not comfortable with much, uh, is great because I can focus on what for me is more important, where I feel, uh, I feel better about and it's more exciting for me, which is actually uh, direct, directing. So merging all these parts, focusing on the camera moves, working with the actors and transforming that stories that it's on paper into visual, knowing that I have a team that is supporting me. So uh, at the beginning, I think, you know, it came natural to direct and operate for me at the same time. But then little by little, I was stepping back uh, and, and that was obviously the right solution. I come from a documentary environment where many times, uh, the director also takes care of the camera, also had it itself. But when it comes to more developed and structured projects, uh, it's better if you can just step back a little bit, have an overview of, of, of what you're doing and what each department should do, 
and and do what a director should do direct when you get the script for the first time because you are still you know with that visual are you storyboarding as you go along are you making little doodles um how what's your process yeah i don't storyboard in a very traditional way like with the actual uh drawing creation uh but i take many reference I take many many reference i do very intense location scouting sessions uh, where I do some tests uh, for the camera moves, for the light. Uh, I pay a lot of attention on that. And uh, I, I like to rehearsing a lot, not necessarily on location or on set, but even before, during prep time, I like to call in the actors and just rehearse, rehearse, because some ideas uh, come, come out in that moment, also for the camera, also for the light, also for the production design. Um, and then uh, merge all together and create some still some references uh, where we can just uh, decide also production wise what's best for the film. Uh, I don't create proper drawings uh, because, um, well, first of all, myself, I'm not really a good drawer, so it's not something that comes natural for myself. And in the indie world, the storyboarding process can be pretty time consuming and sometimes very expensive. Um, so tried to find new, new solutions uh, for that. So far it worked. What, because you've had a diverse, um, selection, cross selection of films that you've directed. What kind of stories speak to you? Hmm. Interesting. I like, uh, human stories for the most part, uh, stories where there is a strong human presence, a strong, uh, relationship between people, uh, or a struggle but all human-based. Um, I think that's what, what, you know, what gets my attention for the most part, uh, because, you know, storytelling is also a way to reflecting on, you know, people's life, on people's world. Uh, of course, there are many ways to do that, and some people are more uh, passionate or sensible, sensitive uh, to science fiction or to animation, and they all serve the same purpose. Uh, on myself, mostly are are human uh, human struggle, human relationships for the most part. And you've got a couple of things coming up. You're you're in post on a film. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So last summer we shot my my last uh, feature film. It's a narrative film uh, called Tales of the Sea. Um, it's an interesting story about uh, migrants, which is a topic that is very present, uh, not only in Europe, but, uh, but also in Europe, in the Mediterranean area. Uh, but it's a comedy. And huge in Italy, because there was a huge wave of, of migrants going into Italy, and uh, the Italian government didn't quite know what to do. So just kind of prefacing that for people listening in. Yeah, Italy, obviously, you know, it's it's a natural port in the Mediterranean Sea and the migration move mostly comes from Africa. So Italy is like one of the, you know, first, if not the first place where they uh, reach the shore. Uh, but we want to change the angle. So this film is a comedy. It's a story between two kids. One is an Italian kid who to prove to his family, it's a very masculine, traditional family, he wants to prove that he can fish the octopus as well, like all the men in his family. He steals the family boat and go out at sea, come back, winner, winner. The last time he tried, he almost killed his uh, cousin, uh, so he's forbidden to do so. So he sneak out of his place, take this boat, go out at sea. Of course, he gets lost. And uh, being lost at sea, he meets uh, African teenager kid like uh, on floating on a dinghy uh, by this meeting a weird relationship starts uh, at the beginning is pretty conflictual and then they be they bond because they understand they need each other to survive and they have this surreal trip with uh, you know um, uh, incredible creatures I would say to not spoil anything uh, that support them or trying to, you know, to, you know, um, create some obstacles for them. At the end, of, they are both saved. So there is a happy ending. 
but it's a different way to think and reflect on a very, very hot topic uh, without any any geopolitical structure uh, and bringing it down to a story of, of people, in the case of, of kids who, who are kids. Which I think will do globally very well because it's a it's a universal problem in in many 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 countries. Um, just touching on the creature without telling us what the creature is. Um, how was how did you build the creature? Um, you know, was it uh, uh, what was what was that like? And did you use uh, virtual production? Um, how, how did you go about? that creature design without actually telling us what the creature is. <laughs> That's interesting because uh, this film, uh, all indie films are big adventures. This one specifically, I would say, has been an incredible adventure for several reasons. First of all, we shot all in location. So we really shot in the middle of the sea. In the South Valley, South Valley in an area called Puglia, which is a beautiful place. Uh, we've been very kindly hosted by the city of Taranto, an amazing place that I suggest everyone to visit because it's pretty unknown, but it's an incredible place. And we shot in the sea with boats. Um, all the production design creatures as well were created by the craft of Alessandro Giuliano, who is a friend and incredible art director, Italian, also living in California, uh, in a location called the Desert Yacht Club in the middle of Joshua Tree Desert, where I shot my very first film called Calypso. So we bonded back then. It's been on all my other projects because it's an incredible talent. And the rest of the team as well participated in the building of this uh, very weird and crazy environment in a pretty difficult place, which is in the middle of so you can imagine, you know, um, the, you know, the, the differences of shooting in studio or in other locations. Um, it was all built in the, in reality. So there's no uh, VFX applied. There is no CGI. Uh, so all everything that was created was mechanical. Yes, well, analogic. Um, it was taken in the middle of the sea and performed quite quite well quite well so you built your own shark is what you're telling me <laughs> you built you, you built your own jaws <laughs> yes without the jaws you built your own jaws <laughs> yeah right. unlike unlike spielberg with his jaws uh did you have any uh issues when you put your creature into the water um uh, on the mechanic aspect of it i have to say that the creatures have been kind with us but the weather was not. Uh, so we, sh yeah, we shot in May, which in that area and that period of time is supposed to be pure summer already. You know, summer's early in South of Italy. Everyone was so excited also because it would have been a very, you know, good place to work for a few weeks. Instead, we ended up starting with four days of non-shoot because the weather was terrible. Uh, not only there, in entire Italy, there was floodings going on. There was rain everywhere. So the biggest challenge was not dealing with the creatures, but was dealing with the weather and with uh, continuity because we were shooting on one side and then the weather was changing. So we couldn't flip uh, and the frame and shoot on the other side. So some scenes needed to be redone. Uh, or maybe the weather was nice, but then the sea was very rough, so we couldn't shoot. So I have to say that all of the creatures needed to be uh, patient with the weather, who has been the, the biggest, the big beat uh, to take care of during production. Yeah. Well, l listen, you lucked out. Spielberg had it the other way around. The weather was good, but the creature, you know, wasn't functioning. So, <laughs> um. Uh, last couple of questions. Where do you see yourself in five years? What lands haven't you conquered that you want to conquer still? Besides tackling Asia. No, uh, I think we are we are going into a very uh, right path. We are producing more and more movies. We just premiered one of our co-productions with uh, America, a film called Echo Village uh, by Phoebe Neer, 
who premiered at the Festival of Rotterdam, which is an incredible uh, platform for independent filmmakers, a very, very interesting festival in Europe. Um, and it was a great experience. Uh, we now have three more films coming out this year and my own film, uh, Once Post-Production, will be over. Uh, we are now scouting for additional uh, projects to, co to produce and co-produce some offers and I just came back from Berlin Film Festival Berlinale to look for more projects. And I think the entire company is growing and is supporting this flow of working on certain projects and investing in others. So in five years from now, I would say uh, the biggest goal I could imagine is to have uh, more and more projects uh, in the production chain, um, interesting and good projects who gain uh, the success they deserve uh, looking back and potentially some important awards uh, won with uh, with some of them, which is also interesting. It's not the ultimate goal, but of course, it's a recognition uh, from the industry as well of, of what you created. So I think that's that's the goal in five years. And your tidbit of knowledge, something that you can give to our listeners who are starting out um, what have you learned along your way that you can share with us uh, and the listeners of Words of Wisdom? Sounds banal, but uh, I think it's really the key. And everyone knows it, but not many really do that. Uh, I think the most important thing in our field is do things. Do. Make the ball rolling. Don't wait for anybody to give you the opportunity. Don't wait the moment when things are right because they're never going to be right enough. Don't wait for the perfect moment because there is no perfect moment. If you want to be a film director or cinematographer, grab a camera and start shooting. And most likely, whatever you're going to shoot will suck. And that's the perfect point because you can fix it. Uh, if you're an editor, same thing. Try to do some, 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 some work and keep one thing in mind, which I think it's also... Uh, turning point in our industry worldwide. Making movies is the goal, is not the tool. Sometimes, sadly, the film is the tool to make money, to become famous, to gain publicity. So the film is the tool. No, no, no. The film is the goal. Whatever comes in between is the tool. And then, of course, money will come, success will come, awards will come. If you do everything in the right way. Maybe it's not going to come in first place. It will come a little later. But that stuff, it will, it will come. But those are consequences. If you make a great movie, no matter if it's super successful, if it's making a lot of money, if it's widely distributed, or if it's shown to a tiny audience, it's a good movie. Once a fellow filmmaker colleague told me, and I totally agree with that, I don't want to make average films for the entire world. I want to make a a film that changed maybe the life of one single person, but that is so effective. I totally agree with that. I concur. Um, thank you so much for coming on Best and Fest. You've been listening to uh, Luca Saveri uh, on Best and Fest. For those that want to see the video component, you can do so on the YouTube channel, La Femme International Film Festival. For those that want to listen to the podcast, you can do it on any platform anywhere in the world. Don't forget to like us, uh, rate us, give us a thumbs up, and pass us on to your friends. Luca, it's been a pleasure. Um, shout out um, just some of your uh, company socials and the DCP. How do people get to DCP for all? Yeah, 100%. Well, the best way to follow me and my projects is looking at me on Instagram. I'm Luchino underscore Severi. Luchino, of course, as a memory of Lucchino Visconti, great Italian director that we all admire. Um, our website is uh, lspginc.com and there are news there always coming up and all the four divisions are published, of course. Uh, if not, to go straight into those, backstage.film is the EPK department with all great hints and uh, content from the latest movie sets uh, we're working on. And then, of course, dcp4all.com if anybody needs uh, some deliverables at an affordable rate, we're always happy to, to help. 
And for all those listening in, if you do go to DCP for all, just mention the La Femme International Film Festival, and um, they will be very kind and give you a discount. Uh, thank you so much, Luca, for coming on Best in Fest. 